Your two favorite GW Sports anchors are at it again. Hello and welcome to another episode of Unstoppable. For those of you who don't know, I'm your anchor Sean Grant and the haircut sitting next to me is my co-anchor Cole Ann Schustegi. We've got a packed show on deck for you today, so Cole, why don't you break it down for us? Sean, I'd be willing to take it a step further and say that we're the two favorite GW TV anchors, period, but I digress. This episode is full of great content. We will be discussing men's and women's basketball, baseball, softball, men's and women's rowing, golf, gymnastics, men's and women's track and cross country, and finally, we will break down men's and women's swimming and diving. After that, I'll get a chance to sit down with James Winchester, the head coach for the men's and women's swimming and diving team. Finally, Parker Jensen will take the hot seat at the desk to tell you what matches are coming up and what you can't miss. All this on Unstoppable. Right wing, good! Tipping things off now with men's basketball, whose season ended abruptly with a second round exit in the A-10 tournament. The Colonials rode some momentum at the end of their regular season, winning four out of their last six games. They then started off the A-10 tournament with a strong 78-72 victory over Fordham. It seemed like the Colonials offense had finally found some rhythm, and some people were hopeful that they could make some noise. That rhythm faltered in the second round, however, and the men's team fell to St. Louis 70-63. The loss marks the end of the careers for two true Colonial Warriors, Yuta Watanabe and Patrick Steves. The Colonials still have a core of young players, however, and now Coach Maurice Joseph will turn his attention to preparing for next season. Cole, what did you see out of this team down the stretch? Well, Sean, like you said, they were competing for an NCAA tournament bid, and going into this tournament, they were playing the best basketball they've been playing all season. Yuta Watanabe was absolutely killing it. Um, co contributions from Justin Mazzula, Patrick Steves, and Terry Nolan Jr., those were all great. So their defense was playing awesome. So it was one of those things where we really felt encouraged with them going into this uh, conference play. Well, and now, and you know, touching on some of those points you just made and diving in a little deeper, I mean, Yuta, in that stretch, right at the end of the season. I mean, he was averaging just under 22 points a game, uh, just 6.9 rebounds, just under seven rebounds. That's well above his season averages. Uh, and, you know, he was touching on all facets of the game. His three-point shooting, you know, defensively, he was blocking shots. He was getting steals. With his shooting, he was stretching the floor. I think most importantly was he was slashing a lot from the wing, which I think early on in the season we didn't see him do as much and was something that, you know, really helps this offense run because when you have him taking a dive to the basket, then they are able to spread the floor out a little bit more, maybe get another pass and I think that that's something that, that really helps with their ball movement. And we can't forget to mention Justin Missoula. Uh, Mojo made the move to Missoula as the starting point guard and uh, bench Jair Bolden uh, from the starting lineup. And this was actually probably the best move he could have made because Missoula really facilitates ball movement. He's a much better point guard, traditionally speaking. He can get guys involved. He's a, a much better at assists. And, uh, and so overall, I think his play really contributed to GW's success as he was able to facilitate the offense much better. Well, you know, and I think a point you've made before, Cole, is Jair is better as a two. And especially if Jair wants to sit there and shoot a bunch of three-pointers, that's the role he's going to have to end up taking on. And, you know, as his career, you know, continues here at GW, you also have Terry Nolan Jr., an explosive athlete who plays very well out on the wing and at the two. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot more of Missoula going into next season because, like you said, once they got some of that ball movement, the offense looked much more natural and it looks like they'd finally found some rhythm. Uh, but, you know, as they went into the A-10 tournament, there was a little bit of cause for concern. Uh, you know, GW barely squeaked out a win over Fordham. It was a team they'd beaten at multiple points during the season. The offense was still performing relatively well, just under 80 points. Um, but, you know, they, it seemed like they'd started to slow down a little and, and it, it, it really, you know, led up to that loss to St. Louis. Yeah, the inconsistencies that played the, plagued the Colonials throughout the season really came to light in that game against St. Louis. And this was a team that they had been struggling with. So ultimately taking the tournament loss, um, but an encouraging season. We look forward to seeing them next year. In comparison, the women's basketball team won the A-10 championship, relying on their sensational defense to cross over and cross through conference play like good old George Washington crossing the Delaware. GW opened up A-10 championship play by making light work of LaSalle and George Mason. GW then took down Dayton, one of the best teams in the conference, holding them to a 32.7 field goal percentage. I'm not even going to talk about the Colonials victory against St. Joe's, that was just embarrassing. 
Brianna Cummings was named the tournament's most outstanding player, while Malin Batista and Kelsey Mahoney earned all tournament team honors. Finally, after making it into the NCAA tournament with an automatic bid, GW lost to the Ohio State Buckeyes 87-45. Sean, what were your major takeaways uh, in, throughout this tournament? Well, you know, Cole, as you talked about, I think it was that vaunted defense that the women had that really carried them through the A-10 tournament. And in the latter half of the season, you know, we, we really haven't talked a lot about how this team was hovering around 500 for a, a big part of the, of the season, and they really made that run in the end. And, you know, we talked about how with the men's team, they cooled off too soon. This team got really hot right at the right time. Um, but, you know, again, touching back on that defense, Against opponents outside of the top 25, the women's team never gave up more than 75 points. I think a point is very impressive given that they were never ranked themselves. And then Dayton, the number one seed in the A-10, uh, GW hold them to only 53 points in the Atlantic 10 tournament. I think all around their defense was just very consistent. Every player did their job. Everyone was going for loose balls. I mean, you saw lots of players on that roster throughout the A-10 tournament. Each of them had at least one block and at least one steal in each of the games. So really a team effort. There was no one player who was at that anchor on defense, but everyone contributed. However, that defense did not show up against the Buckeyes as they lost 87-45, to like I mentioned. And it's interesting to see the dichotomy between conferences when tournament season comes around. Ohio State in the Big Ten, GW in the Atlantic 10. Um, it, it's just it's, it's, it's curious to see how their play matches up with our play. And so it's something that we need to look forward to uh, and make sure that we're staying up on par with those programs. Right, well, and I think another thing you got from that Ohio State game, it wasn't just the defense, but it was also the offense, 45 points, a very low total. And, you know, the women's offense never really found a good stride, kind of like the men's did at the end of the season. Uh, you know, in that Atlantic 10 tournament, they, the team never put up more than 69 points in one game. And I think a big reason for the struggles on offense was their three-point shoot. Uh, you know, all season long, they were never able to find consistency outside the arc. And that really, you know, that really hurts your offense when you have such strong forwards like Kelly Prangy and Neela Luma. But, but then if you don't have the shooting to back it up, if you're not able to spread the floor out, teams are able to collapse that. I mean, I think we saw a lot of defenses ended up running 2-3 zones against uh, GW because then they could just collapse down on Prangy and on Neela Luma. And I think that's a reason why their offense uh, faltered at the end of the season. And last point, Sean, I, I think we have to mention that the future looks very bright for the GW program. Coach Rosati had an outstanding performance this season, um, so there's a lot to be encouraged about. Right, and you know, you do have a lot of freshmen on that team like China Latimer and Neela Luma. Now, throwing a curveball and taking you out to the ballpark with the baseball team now, where the Colonials currently hold a 16-12 and 12 record. With that being said, they have an absolutely dominant home record of 12-2, and two, showing that Barcroft Park is not a friendly place to play, especially if you're in the Atlantic 10 Conference. Statistically speaking, GW hitters have been sensational at the plate. Five players in their starting nine have a batting average of above 300, much better than the conference average of 242. Additionally, GW is well above the conference average in home runs, runs, hits, and RBIs. The Colonials' bullpen rotation is also firing on all cylinders. Most notably, Nathan Woods and Elliot Ramo have been dealing from the bump with ERAs of 2.09 and 2.50, respectively. Next up, GW will play a three-game series against North Carolina Central. Bringing the outfield walls in 200 feet, the softball team is off to a hot start, racking up 22 wins, 15 of those being at home. It would be an understatement to say that the Colonials are dominating the batter's box. With the team batting an average of 331 with 300 hits, 26 home runs, and 195 RBIs, GW has been raking opponents non-conference and conference alike. The Colonials aren't playing softball, they're playing hardball. George Washington opens up their A-10 road schedule against Rhode Island, beginning a long streak of games away from the beautiful and fully integrated Mount Vernon campus. Sean, how can the Colonials maintain the success that they've seen at home? on the road. Well, you know, Cole, I think it's always difficult to, you know, say how is a team going to maintain that success, especially when you see a team play so many home games right at the start of the season. You know, when you play that many home games, you really get uh, adjusted and acclimated to playing in your own ballpark, and especially if it's a hitter-friendly ballpark, it, you know, it might be hard to make a transition going on the road. That's not to take anything away from how strong the women have started off the season, um, but it will definitely be a transition for them. You know, the bats have really come alive, though. I mean, now that we're talking about it, they have eight games where they tallied double-digit runs 
and they also won seven games by mercy rule after five innings just because of how many runs they scored. So when you couple those facts with the other facts you highlighted uh, in the recap, I, I think it really speaks to just how strong these hitters have been. And, and Sean, I feel like we can't talk about softball and not mention Jenna Cohn. The sophomore tore it up last year being a sensational freshman and she's continued it this season thus far. Uh, currently has a 440 average. That means she's uh, hitting half of the sh uh, half of the pitches that she sees and she has an on base percentage of 517 which means that she's getting on base very well. So her success has been absolutely phenomenal. Well, and a couple other points there. I also think Cole, she has eight home runs and 43 RBIs. Like we mentioned, you know, the team has around 200 RBIs. So that's she accounts for nearly a quarter of the team's offense, which you know, I think that's just utter dominance from her. We'll have to see if she can sustain this streak as you know, as they move on the away stretch, like I said. But if she does, I think there should be some uh, some A-10 awards in store for her. Yeah, she's been sensational. From the beautiful Vern to the toxic Potomac, let's head out to, onto the boats with the men's rowing team as their spring season has gotten underway. The Colonials made their spring debut against second-ranked Harvard and fellow preppy Ivy Leaguer 10th-ranked Cornell. The 1V, 2V, and 3V boats posted times of 6 minutes and 19.445 seconds, 6 minutes and 31.20 seconds, and 6 minutes and 31.9 seconds, respectively. GW finished third in all these events. This past weekend, the men also competed in the George Washington Invitational. Similar to the men's team, women's rowing also competed in the George Washington Invitational this weekend on that toxic Potomac you mentioned, Cole. Leading up to that event, the Lady Colonials blew the competition out of the water and posted one of their best team performances to date at the Murphy Cup. The team saw three of their four boats earn medal honors in a field of 18 crews. Both the Varsity 8-man boat and the JV 8-man boat placed first in their respective morning races before advancing to the afternoon grand finals. In that meet, the boats challenged their opponents and finished the day with a pair of third place performances. We're going to head to a short commercial break now, but when we return, Cole and I will wrap up this rundown. Welcome back. While this may not be their tradition unlike any other, the men's golf team had an impressive showing at Chambers Bay Golf Course in Seattle, Washington. GW finished third amongst the competition, while Logan Lowe captured his third collegiate victory in a sudden death playoff. Shooting a 4 under 67 in his final round, Lowe propelled his team into third place, matching the team's best finish thus far this season. Lowe's 5-under performance at the Red Hawk Invitational resulted in him being named the Atlantic 10 Co-Golfer of the Week. Lowe, who has been named Golfer of the Week three times in his career, is the second straight Colonial to be honored with an A-10 Weekly Award. The Colonials will participate in the Greenbrier Invitational on April 9th through the 10th and will culminate their season at the Atlantic 10 Championships. Let's put those drivers down now and head out to the mats with women's gymnastics where the Lady Colonials have continued their spring dominance for yet another season. Since the beginning of March, the team placed first out of four teams at the Brownie and Girl Scout Day Meet, first out of three teams at the Senior Day Meet, and third out of six teams at the EAGL Championship. These efforts were enough to earn the women a national ranking of 19 and a spot at the NCAA Raleigh Regional Competition. Along with the team's success, senior Cami Drew and Allaire continues to dazzle, and she was named a 2018 regular season All-American and a 2018 American Athletic Inc. finalist. The AAI award is considered by some to be the Heisman Trophy for gymnastics and is awarded to the most outstanding senior gymnast in the nation. We wish the women's team and Drew and Allaire the best of luck in bringing home the hardware. In an impressive fashion, the Colonials clinched their second consecutive title at the Atlantic 10 Championship meet. 
most notably Gustav Hochfeldt, Alexander Auster, Max Forstenhauler, and Adam Drury finished the championship with a gold medal in the meet closing 400 free relay and a program record time of 2 minutes and 57 seconds. James Winchester was named Co-Men's Swimming Coach of the Year, solidifying the team's dominance and impressive coaching. GW earned itself a repeat championship, and Hockfelt was named the meet's most outstanding performer after winning individual gold medals in the 50-yard freestyle, 100-yard backstroke, and 200-yard backstroke, and four more relay golds. Hockfelt also competed in the 200-yard backstroke at the NCAA Swimming and Diving Championships, finishing 36 with a time of 1 minute and 43 seconds. This performance also included a record-breaking effort and the 100-yard backstroke in which he placed 18th nationally with a time of 45.99 seconds. Keeping it in the pool now with women's swimming and diving, where the Lady Colonials have powered through their slate of spring meets. Most recently, the team placed 8th out of 31 teams at the CSCAA National Invitational. Individually, junior Emily Zhang led the way for the team, claiming the silver medal in the 100-yard medley relay. Sophomore Gemma Atherley also had a strong showing in the meet, finishing 10th in the 200-yard backstroke, helping the Colonials rack up a total of 598.5 points. The strong finish at the National Invitational capped off a season where GW jumped up the A-10 rankings and broke many program records. The George Washington men's track team began their 2018 outdoor season this past weekend, competing in the Raleigh Relays in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Navy Invitational in Annapolis, Maryland. Carter Day began the season with an impressive performance in the 5,000 meter race at the Raleigh Relays with a time of 40. Mm. It's okay. Come on. I We're almost it. there. It's fine. See, this is another reason why I hate Andy in men's track and cross country. The George Washington men's track team began their 2018 outdoor season this past weekend competing in the Raleigh Relays in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Navy Invitational in Annapolis, Maryland. Carter Day began the season with an impressive performance in the 5,000-meter race and the Raleigh Relays with a time of 14 minutes and 22 seconds. Including Day's record-setting time, a total of 12 new personal records were set over the weekend, with five coming from the men's squad. Don't take those spikes off just yet because we've got women's track and field to round out the rundown. Like their male counterparts, the Lady Colonials started their outdoor season with a pair of individual meets. At the Raleigh Relays, sophomore Suzanne Danaheim set a personal record in the 5,000-meter event with a time of 17 minutes and 38.25 seconds. Hallie Brown also placed well in the 1,500-meter event with a time of 4 minutes and 34.32 seconds. Then, at the Navy Invitational, the Colonials had a host of athletes post personal records, highlighted by sophomore Greta Goetz's PR in the 400-meter event and freshman Catherine Nohilly's PR in the 800-meter event. With a packed outdoor season still on tap, we expect more strong performances like these from the women's team. We're going to go to a short commercial break now, but when we come back, Cole will get the chance to sit down with the men's and women's swimming and diving coach, James Winchester. Stay tuned. Great journalism matters because it's critical to a democracy that the public is informed and engaged and involved. And that happens by having credible information. And so the most important thing, whatever the delivery platform, whatever the technology, whatever the business model, is that the information itself is coming in solid and important ways and is being conveyed in compelling ways because there's so much noise and competition out there. And so that's what I really want our students to be able to do. Be brilliant storytellers, keen observers, and compelling communicators. Raise high. This isn't just our battle cry. It's our call, our challenge. Because when you were called to Washington, you were called to higher expectations, to a higher standard. We are called here to advance knowledge, to serve society, to change the world. This is the George Washington University, and what we make is history. So stand up, be bold, take risks, press on. Push harder. Raise high. Welcome back. James Winchester's illustrious career as a swimming and diving coach came into fruition at the University of Utah, where he was named a two-time NCAA Assistant Coach of the Year honorable mention. Since coming to GW, Winchester has led GW to a rapid program turnaround as the Colonials claimed a repeat Atlantic 10 championship crown in 2018. 
In just three years at the helm, Winchester has coached a two-time All-American, a two-time A-10 Performer of the Year, and Gustav Hockfeldt. Additionally, he has helped earn 12 A-10 All-Conference nods and three A-10 All-Academic honorees on the men's side. Additionally, the GW women claimed three gold medals and silvers. Joining me now is Coach James Winchester. Coach, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Cole. <laughs> so we kind of talked about your previous su success. How has your past experience contributed to you as a coach? Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to have some unique experiences at some different schools. Um, obviously, you mentioned the University of Utah and being at the Pac-12 level. It's, uh, um, you know, it's pretty phenomenal to be around that sort of level of athletes that have been to the Olympics or, um, or All-Americans at the NCAA Division I level. Um, but I've also been at the mid-major level before. Um, I was the head coach at the University of New Orleans for a little bit as well. And um, that was a great experience, uh, especially coming out of Hurricane Katrina down there. And um, I actually got my start at a, a Division II school called Drury University which uh, um, their school has won like 15 or 20 NCAA Division II championships. So I've been lucky enough to um, be around a lot of successful coaches and programs and uh, in some as aspects, uh, I guess, see how it gets done. Now, you kind of mentioned individual performers at the University of Utah. Yep. We have to mention Gustav Hockfeldt yep. because he had such a great season. Uh, so what did you see from him this year and how did he contribute to the team success? Um, Gustav's a, a incredibly hardworking kid. I mean, he's uh, um, in swimming. You don't usually see someone that wants to be a student of the game. I mean, you might say that in basketball or football or soccer, but um, he really is. He's someone that loves watching world-class swimming and seeing what the best do. Um, usually in swimming, kind of like running, you just kind of go up and down and keep going. But um, he, he really has, uh, you know, this year turned it up a notch in the sense of his work ethic, his leadership as a captain, um, and also so just in, in sort of that application of uh, finding the, I guess, the little things to do better. Um, for the team, I mean, his influence is huge and uh, um, it's not just his individual performances, it's also how uh, he treats his teammates, how he supports his teammates, because, uh, you know, he needs them to, to be supportive, for him to be supportive too. But it's very much a, um, a family culture in the sense of, uh, um, you know, not just what they've done for him, but what he's done in the sense of leading them at the same time too. Now, how do you continue to recruit kids like you, Stoff? Um, <laughs> for both the men's and women's, because obviously they have, they have such a big impact on the team. So can you kind of delve into your recruiting process and what kind of student athlete you want coming to GW? Um, GW is a very unique institution. And for us, I mean, we're, we're all about finding the right fit. Um, luckily for us uh, in recruiting, you can look at the times and see sort of the progressions. Um, but what we're really looking for beyond that is, are you hardworking in the classroom? Uh, do you want to be in an environment that GW offers? I mean, we're such a unique school with so many strengths that um, a lot of the academic side, GW sells itself. Um, so for us, we're really looking for those, those fits first in those areas. Um, and then after that, we're looking for the right type of people, people that want to be selfless, come in, work hard, um, be part of a family environment, and at the end of the day, want to get better, not just as a student or an athlete, but also to, to get better as a person. Okay, so two years, two titles. Do you feel pressure to three-peat? Um, you know, when you get to this sort of level, uh, um, the pressure per se, or, or you should anticipate success, or you should always be striving for that level once you're already there. Um, for us, I mean, three years ago, and I've mentioned this before, I mean, it was a little bit more of a dream on the men's side, um, and then we made it happen, and now it, it, it is our expectation to be consistently competing at the, at the top of the A-10 and for us to um, be making noise at the national level. Um, part of the challenge for us now is to put our women in that position as well. Uh, last year, or this year, we took third overall. Uh, you know, it was a really fantastic uh, performance, but um, in all honesty, I won't be happy until we've won on both sides. No, absolutely. And you've, it, like, I, like you said, you experienced men's success, but what things are you working for in your program to 
kind of parlay that into the women's side of the side of things. Um, there's so much that our men's and women's teams uh, do together. I mean, it's not like soccer where they're completely separate. I mean, um, we're together all the time. A lot of the kids, they're, they're in class together all the time, training together all the time, whether it's in the weight room or the pool. So a lot of the sense of the, the cultural standards are the same and the expectations are the same on both sides. Um, the women's side has been a little bit more competitive. Uh, Richmond have, uh, have won something like 12 of the last 14 championships. So um, there, there's a little less opportunity, I guess, in that aspect of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of the equalness that the men had to get up there straight away. But um, the women's conference, a little deeper, but I feel like we're getting really, really close too. And it's uh, taking a little extra time, but I think we're, we're right there. I think we're really close. You mentioned the national stage, and I'm wondering how programs like Texas <laughs> and Cal they do it. And so what kind of things do they do in their program that you can take and apply to GW to kind of get it into the national level? Um, you know, for those schools, you're talking about the best of the best. I mean, they have um, a lot of certain advantages that, that we don't in the sense of um, history, uh, tradition, um, a lot of athletes that are training at those sites that are, um, that are staying there post-collegiate. Um, you know, it's, uh, those are some great, great things, but at the same time too, it's uh, the things we try to learn out of those environments are like the culture of those teams and setting those athletes up for success. Uh, you know, what, what type of science are they using? What type of uh, training sets uh, are they putting into place? Um, you know, there's some things that, that we're not gonna get and, uh, um, you know, compared to some of those schools, but at the same time, there's, uh, there's some very unique things here at GW, and, and I talked a little bit earlier about it with FIT, mm -hmm. Um, that those schools definitely can't offer. So we're, we're unique, we really are, but it's, it's uh, you know, coming back sort of full circle on that, it is, it's about finding the right fit of a student athlete that wants to be successful um, in all avenues here and not just uh, maybe what some of those other schools can offer. With that being said, what are your goals for next season? Um, you know, we we barely seems like we barely finished this season with NCAA's just uh, what, uh, what seems like over a week ago, and with Gemma Raffley at the Commonwealth Games right now. Um, we're already sort of at that stage of reevaluating with the student athletes, some of their summer goals and plans, um, as well as uh, um, prep preparing for, for next year. Um, right now, a lot of what we're working on, and it sounds a little smaller maybe, but is getting the team sort of feedback and involvement in the culture and our standards and really laying the foundations in that aspect before we start talking per se about uh, um, you know, some of the bigger goals. It's, uh, I know this year we didn't talk about championships championships until at least uh, until October so we're a month into the season um, but with success comes the expectation like we talked about earlier so um, we might not talk about it much but um, we want to be a successful program and success means uh, you know bringing home some of the hardware too so I'm not I'm not gonna say it but we want to be bringing the hardware home again <laughs> so what women do you think will be key contributors to your success next season in and how are they going to play a role in the team success overall? We've had some really good progression from our women this year. Um, you know, Abby Fusco's left a heck of a legacy as a senior graduating now, but the ones that are going to have to step up um, are going to be Emily Zhang. I mean, she's been phenomenal the three years and a real leader inside the pool and is really developing her leadership skills outside of the pool. Um, we've got a couple of other girls in the junior class next year. Um, Gemma Affili and Jackie Torres are going to be expected to step up and we've also had some really good freshmen this year that'll be sophomores um, that, that will have the opportunity to step up as well too. Um, our recruiting classes coming in we feel are very strong on both sides so we really think our women are, um, are going to improve um, but there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for um, a lot of our girls to kind of continue their development and, and, and step up as well. Do you feel as if the athletes that are stepping up and filling those shoes are cognizant of what they have to do? And do you think that they're up to the task? Um, I believe so. I mean, when the expectation starts becoming more of a reality, which it has been in our recent history compared to when I started, um, you're well aware of what you're working hard towards. Um, we might not talk about it every single day, but you know that there's a, a sort of end to the process and uh, um, a, an evaluation stage with our performances at that stage. Um, so, but I think at the same time too, I mean, we really value um, 
it might sound simple, but it's work. We really do value sort of like the hard work and how we put things together. We're very process oriented. So a lot of it is our focus on the now and sort of those things that we can control, um, especially over the, the six months that the season can take. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen with injuries and illnesses and obviously academic stress at the same time too. But, um, you know, we really try and focus a lot more on the right now, the process, the hard work, showing up each and every day, um, having a great experience and uh, you know putting those sorts of things together towards like the end goals um, so the girls you know and the guys they know that there's more hard work ahead they're uh, they're not complacent as a coaching staff we don't allow them to get complacent but um, they're fully I think aware of uh, where we're heading and where we want things to go coach thank you so much oh, for joining pleasure. me thank you we're going to commercial real quick, but when we return, Parker Jensen will join us at the desk and give you an update on upcoming competitions. Thanks, Coach. Thank you. History isn't only what's happened. History is also what's happening. At the George Washington University, we're making history every day. We pass legislation that shapes our lives, our culture, and our future. We live the mantra, champions in the classroom, in the community, and in competition. Which instills in us a determination to reach new heights. We break new ground in the treatment of patients and the study of disease and tackle the most important challenges in our society. We form new relationships and grow as entrepreneurs. And we imagine new ways to connect on a global scale. As alumni, we make history by supporting students. We create scholarships that make an exceptional education attainable. We provide tools and facilities that allow new ideas to come alive. We enhance CW's academics by attracting world-renowned faculty. And delivering career-launching opportunities. I'm making history. I'm making history. I'm making history. The George Washington University is making a difference. The George Washington University is making history. Join us. Welcome back. Parker Jensen joins us now here at the desk to get us in the loop on all the Colonial home games fans need to see. Parker? What do you have for us? Well, thanks, Sean. And I'd just like to say really quickly, although I don't have the awkward charisma as our own Andy Weber, I will certainly be trying my best. Let's kick it off with men's soccer as they start their Wednesday morning right on April 10th as they take on American University at 9.30 a.m. Men's baseball will be taking on a home stint against Richmond on, at Barcroft on Friday, April 13th at 3 p.m., Saturday at 1 p.m., and Sunday at 12 p.m. Women's softball will be facing LaSalle up at the Vern at 1 p.m. on Saturday, April 14th, and joining them an hour later is women's tennis, will they face off Davidson at 2 p.m. Finally, women's lacrosse will be lighting it up at St. Joseph's on April 20th at 3 p.m. Guys? Well, that's all the GW sports we could cram into one show. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at GWTV underscore sports. We'll see you next show.